This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, Shalom Aleichem, everyone. I apologize for the delay, but unbeknownst to me, they moved Munsi many miles further from the five towns. It must have happened recently. And there was a hurricane and flooding and other natural and unnatural disasters on the way here. But thank you for hanging in there. So uh, thank you, Rabar and Subar, um, and Ramnas and Wadler, for uh, assisting with uh, tonight's program. Let's get right to it. The Gemara and Soita and Daf Memtes, and of course, thank you to my dear friend for filling in for the first uh, segment of today's shir. Um, let us begin with the Gemara and Soita gives us a very bleak outlook of the period at the end of days. The Gemara tells us about a period called Ikvesa de Mashiach, the heels of Mashiach. You know, Rav Moshe Shapiro says, why is the period immediately before the coming of Mashiach called Ikvesa de Mashiach, the heel of Mashiach? The thickest, most coarse part of the body, the part of the body which is least sensitive, is the heel. The heel almost has no feeling. That's us in the end of days. We're very callous, we're very jaded, we're insensitive. Things could happen in the world, disaster after disaster, and we don't even pay attention to it. We're not sensitive to it. We don't feel it. So is that, does that mean it's hopeless? No, it doesn't mean it's hopeless. Because as insensitive and callous as we are, in a certain sense, the heel is very sensitive, and that is if you tickle it, Ramosh Shapiro would say, well, if you tickle the heel, it actually is the most sensitive part of the body. So there is still an element of us that is still receptive and is open to the messages of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Anyway, the Mishnah at the end of Saita says as follows. What will, be life, what will life be like at the end of days? Chutzpah yaski, brazenness will proliferate, v'yoyker yamir, there'll be inflation, there'll be a multitude of grapes, but wine will be very expensive, the government will turn to heresy, there'll be no rebuke, the houses of the sages will be houses of ill repute. Uh, the north of Eretz will be destroyed. The wisdom of the sages will be despised. The fathers, fathers will have to stand up for their children. A daughter will stand up against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy will be hit the, ma- the members of their household. And so on and so forth. And the Mishnah ends off seemingly on a good note. The Mishnah says... What could we rely on? Says the Mishnah, So it seems like the Mishnah is saying that despite all of the disasters and tragedies of the end of days, there's one redeeming feature. We have one positive note. Let's end on a good note. Namely, at the very least, with no other alternative, we could rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The problem though is, and this is the question of Ramor Chai Gifter Zechazak Levracha, that the Mishnah just gave us a whole laundry list of disasters that will transpire at the end of days. Why would the Mishnah end on a good note? We're trying to say how terrible things will be in the end of days. Why will the Mishnah end up? But don't worry, because at least we could rely on the Rebbein Shalaylam. Why are we ending on a... So you say, what do you mean? We always end a Masechta on a good note. The problem is this is not the end of the Masechta because we are yet to cite a b'raisa, the b'raisa of Pinchas ben Yoyer about the Torah of Yolidei Zahiros, Lidei Zrizos, Lidei Nikios, and so on and so forth. So the Mishnah would not end this way just to end on a good note because this is not the end of the Masechta. So why give this anticlimactic ending that despite all the tragedies, nevertheless we could still rely on the Rebbein Islam? Question number two. There's this interesting practice. I once heard a story from uh, Rav Naya Chayzik Obeyam said over that there's a, there was a hotel in the Catskills, maybe it's still around, I'm not sure, called Zucker's Hotel. And the Gedolim used to frequent it, including Rav Moshe, Rav Schneer Cutler. And Rav Moshe had a very interesting custom in the nine days. He would make a siyam every day on the nine days so that the people in the hotel could partake of meat each day on the nine days. And Rav Schneer was sitting off in the corner and he was sort of modestly not partaking of the meat. And uh, one would have thought that this is a good practice. So Rav Moshe went over to him, he said, 
you actually have to partake of the meat. Because if you don't take the flesh eggs, then you're going to have a guy eating his hot dog and he's not really going to enjoy it because in the back of his mind he's going to think it's better to be machmer and not partake of the seum like Rav Schneir is doing. So you need to eat the meat so that other yidin could eat gesunta height and eat with uh, beteyavon. What's this custom that Jews have that when it comes to the nine days all of a sudden we become such big masmidim and we make siyumim and barbecues it seems like a, a, taking advantage of a loophole. We know the Gemara tells us that there were people who used to uh, bring the meiser in, bring the tua in through the window so that there wouldn't be chayv in meiser and that's considered inappropriate. We don't look for loopholes to get around the halacha and that's what a seum seems to be. After all, the halacha, actually Medina de Gemara, you're allowed to eat meat in the nine days. The only time you're not to eat meat, Medina de Gemara, is Suda Samafsekas. But it's already in Minhag Yisrael not to eat meat for the whole nine days. In fact, the Archa Shulchan writes that eating meat in the nine days is an Isr da Iraisa. How's that? Because since it's Minhag Yisrael, and it's a Minhag that Kal Yisrael has accepted upon themselves, it has the status of a neder, a vow, and therefore violating it is considered an Isr da Iraisa. So, why would we have a custom that one, should, one makes a seum during the nine days and uses it as a loophole? Get over it, you know. You, there are enough milchik uh, recipes to get through the nine days that we don't have to make a seum to be able to eat meat. Let's address another interesting question. A, a, a fair stira, a clear stira. The Navi Yirmiya says, What is the reason for Chorben Bayis Rishain? Pasuk says, we're going to read this on Shabbos Chazoin. Uh, excuse me, we read this on Tishabav. Alma of the Haaretz. Why was the land destroyed? Vayoymer Hashem. Alaz vames toirasi. Bittol toira. Ba'is Rishon was destroyed because of Bittol Torah. Who says that? The prophet Jeremiah, the Navi Yirmiyahu. He says Ba'is Mikdash was destroyed because of Bittol Torah. And yet the Gemara says in Yuma, Dav Testament Beis, why was the first Ba'is Mikdash destroyed? The big three, Avoy Dezara, Gilei Arayos, Shvichas How do you reconcile that? The Navi says Bittol Torah, the Gemara says Avay Dezara, Gil Arayos, Shvichas In fact, the Yerushalmi also chimes in on this. And the Yushalmi in Chagiga says that even though Klal Yisrael violated Abba Yisraelas Shuchas Damim, that wasn't it. God overlooked that. Hashem was mevater on Abba Yisraelas Gila Raisa Shuchas Damim, v'loy viter al avoyin bittol Taira. So what's? But that's not what the Gemara says. The Gemara says it was because of the the cardinal three. Hashem was not mevater on Abba Yisraelas Gila Raisa Shuchas Damim. So how do you uh, reconcile this whole mix? So there's an amazing exposition of the Al Shech HaKadosh. You know, you could give a lot of compliments to a Rosh Hashiva, a Rav. You could tell them it was a beautiful shear, a wonderful shear, a Geshmaka shear, a stimulating shear. The Al Shech was given the best possible comment by the Ari HaKadosh. The Arizal says to the Al Shech, you are mechavein el ha'emes, that what you said was true, you know. It could be interesting, stimulating, gishmak, but at the end of the day, it might not be true. The al Sheikh the Arizal says, was mechavein el ha'emes bidra shoysav. In fact, the al Sheikh was a Talmud muvak of the Beis Yosef. In fact, the Beis Yosef, at the end of his life, he was, did not even have enough kayach to sign his name. The al Sheikh would sign his name. And the al explains this whole business based on a mashal. The mashal goes like this. There was a king. The king was a grouch. He was always in a bad mood. However, there was someone who was able to assage the anger of the king. And that is the king had a musician. And the musician would play his music. And the magical tones of this musician would exhilarate the king, would calm the king, would... The king was... His whole mood, his whole 
His whole perspective changed when he heard the magical tones of this musician. Word got out that the musician robbed the bank. They came and they told the king. The king, he, he didn't, even, it didn't even register. The, the sound waves didn't even go into his ears. He loved the, the musician too much. And then they told the king, this guy, he assaulted somebody and the king didn't want to pay attention. The next thing you know, the king was told the guy uh, killed 10 people. There was nothing the musician could do to even register in the mind of the king. And then the king was told that he was involved in a minor altercation and in the course of, the, the course of this altercation, the musician injured his hand. The king said he was involved in an altercation, he injured his hand, kill him, off with his head. So they asked the king, I don't understand, the guy robbed, the guy assaulted, the guy murdered, and he didn't pay attention, and he was involved in a minor altercation, and he injured his hand, and now you're killing him? So the king said, you have to understand. All of those things really should have annoyed me. But I was so persuaded, I was so taken, I was so enchanted by the beautiful melodies of this musician that I just couldn't pay attention to, to the, his wrongdoing. But as soon as his hand was injured and he could no longer play those magical tones, so I was forced to look his wrongdoings in the eye and of course I was very disturbed by them and I punished him for all of those wrongdoings. Says the Al Shekha Kadosh, the Nimshel should be obvious. For seven generations, Klal Yisrael committed Avodazara, Gili Arayos, and Shri Chazdamim. And yet, the Rebbein Shem let it fly, he let it go. He ignored it for seven generations. The reason he ignored it is because despite the fact that Klal Yisrael were wicked, and we violated how many Chayvei Krisus during the times of the first base of Mikdash? David's going to tell us, 36, Gematria, Eicha, Eicha 36. So Klai Yisrael were wicked, but Hashem let it fly for seven generations. But in the eighth generation, Hashem said, I can't, I can't ignore this anymore. Because for the first seven generations, the Jewish people played the enchanting, magical tones and melodies of Limarat Torah, and the music, the Zmirais, Hayuli Chilkecha, the beautiful tones of Limarat Torah were so enchanting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he ignored, he did not pay attention to the many chaton that Klal Yisrael were involved in, and therefore he let it fly. But in the eighth generation, when Klal Yisrael started to be mevatel from the learning, and there was bitol Torah, and the music stopped, once the music stopped, then Hashem had no choice but to focus and hone in on the Avodah Zarah, Gili Arayas, and Shri Damim. But so long as the Jewish people played the sweet melody of Torah, Hashem ignored the Avodah Zarah, Gili Arayas, Shri Damim. You like this pshat of the Yalshech? Does it sound good to you? Does that make you feel good? That a person could be a murderer, an adulterer, an idolater, and as long as they're learning daf yoimi, Hashem says, no man, I don't care what you do. You could assault, you could be a murderer, you could avodagili arayas, as long as you're learning Gemara Rashi Toysvis, you could be an oisvarf, rasha, menuaf, metuav, every avir in the world, as long as you learn Gemara Rashi Toysvis. Wow, what a beautiful, wonderful concept. That you could be disgusting and despicable, but God will ignore it as long as you're sitting in front of a Gemara. Wow, what a beautiful idea. Says the Maharit, and he doesn't quote, quote the Al Sheikh by name, but he basically says the Al Sheikh's Malshal word for word. So there's no question he's referring to the Al Sheikh. That this approach, the Maharit says, is a Chilol Hashem. It is a desecration of the name of God to say, that God ignores the sins of those who learn. Says the Marit, someone who is an Avarian, God hates their learning. Better that they don't learn. Someone who's committing terrible Averis, better they don't learn. Rebbe Hashem is disgusted by their learning. Their learning is a defilement. God says, I don't want it. Me be cash, is me at the camera, my scat say, get out of shul, get out of the base medrash, close the Gemara. I hate it, says Rebbe Shalom. The 
Maritz says, even though it's based on the Zoyar, seems to say that someone who's involved in learning, God asks no questions of them. But says the Maharit, who by the way, Rabbi Yonis and Ibishitz, and the Rabbi Yaakov Emden, both say he was the greatest of all the Achroinim, Rabbi Yosef Trani. The Maharit says, doesn't the Mishnah say in Pirkei Avos, Lo'i ha-medrish hu ha-ikr el ha-masa, the ikr is not the learning, the ikr is your actions, the way you conduct yourself. Doesn't the Gemara tell us that Rabbi Chanina ben Tradyon was asked, Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Yossi ben Kisna, am I going to go to Olam Haba, Rabbi Chanina ben Tradyon? who taught Torah Barabim, who even when the Romans made a decree that anyone who teaches Torah Barabim will be executed, and they, they yanked out the tongue of Rabbi Hanina ben Tan, and they dragged it in the street. Even a man who was Moser Nefesh to teach Torah, he wanted to know if he's going to go to Olam Abba, and Rabbi Yosef ben Kismo said, yeah, if you performed mitzvahs. So says the Marit, here's a man who taught Torah Barabim for decades and decades, and that would not bring him to Olam Abba if he did not have your Shamayim and perform mitzvahs. Says the Marit, Misha'im by your Shamayim, Mutav Shaloy Talameh. Better not to learn. And you're saying that the Yibbana Shalom found enchanting the music of wicked people? How could you say that Kali Yisrael worshipped Avodah Zarah, committed Gil Arayas, murdered, and Hashem was enchanted by their Limit Torah and their music? Says the Ma'rit, this pshat is no less than a Chilol Hashem. Say, how could you say that? I'm not saying anything. I'm just reading to you the words of the Ma'rit, Shal Setshubis Ma'rit. The only thing is, it behooves us to explain what does the al mean. The al gives this mashal. He says that that's how you reconcile the Gemara and Yuma with the Psukim in Yirmiya, that really it was because of Avodah Zarah, Gilaraz, and Shri Chazdamen, but Hashem overlooked it so long as Klai Yisrael were learning. So how do we explain the al So Rav Shach, and by the way, this year, you know, there are different kufais in Klal Yisrael. You have uh, Goinim, you have Rishonim, you have Achroinim. And the uh, most recent period, perhaps you could call the period of the Rosh Yeshiva. So the, the ideas from this year basically come from uh, the Rosh Yeshiva, as we're going to see. We started with Rav Gifter's Kasha, and Rav Shach said as follows. That Klal Yisrael is considered, I actually saw this in a Sefer, and the Sefer quoted Rav Shach in the Sefer Machshavas Musar. So I looked through Machshavas Musar, it ain't there. So I went back to the author, and he said he made a mistake. It's not in Machshavas Musar, but he heard it from Rav Shach. Okay, so we're going to have to take his word for it, that this is what Rav Shach said. Rav Shach said, Kla Yisro is one entity. We're a Chativa Achas, we're one unit. And if there are members in Klal Yisrael who are Yerei Shamayim and are God-fearing and do not commit sin, the learning of those people is so sweet, is so enchanting, is so magical to the, the ears of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that even though there might be other members of Klal Yisrael who are worshipping idols and are murderers, and are committing terrible sins, the music of those who are learning Torah properly with Yerah Shamayim will be so enchanting and so magical to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that it will allow Hashem to overlook the sins of the rest of Klal Yisrael. So heaven forbid of the individual himself who is committing heinous sin, the Yibam Shalom will be disgusted by their learning Torah if they don't have Yerah Shamayim. Nevertheless, since Klai Yisrael is one entity, the pure learning of those who are not involved in Avera will be so enchanting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that because of that Hashem will say, I can't touch Klai Yisrael. Klai Yisrael is untouchable so long as that beautiful, sweet music is being played. That is how Rav Shach explained what the al meant. Not that the learning of an Oyved Avod is sweet HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but the learning of those who have your Shamayim will be so sweet to Hashem that 
it will, Hashem will, so to speak, overlook the sins of those who are not learning Torah. So I want to tell you, I am coming right now straight from the city of Lemberg, Lvov. Yesterday, I was in the Ukraine. And why did I go to Lemberg? Good question. There's actually more traffic in Lemberg than there is getting from the five towns to Munsi. But I did some research and there are a number of Gedoyle Oilam buried in the city of Lemberg. Now apparently nobody goes there and that's why uh, the directions we were given were a little uh, confusing. But buried in the city of Lemberg was Rabbi Yosef Shal Halevi Natanzan, the Shal Lameshev. Rabbi Yaakov Ornstein, the Yeshua Siakov. The Rabbi Yeshua Falk Katz, the Sma. The Sma is buried in Lemberg. Now, by the way, you know, the Sma brings a psak from his wife. There's a very interesting psak from the wife of the Sma. The Sma, you know, the Sma wrote four perushim. All four of these perushim fall under the banner called Beis Yisrael. So first, the Sma did not agree with uh, many things in the Shulchan Aruch. And he wrote, because he felt that the Beis Yosef wrote a commentary but didn't explain the Torah. He felt the Beis Yosef was just writing his Psaq, but it's not explaining what the Torah holds. So the Beis Yosef, so the Sma wrote a Perush on the, on the, um, Shulchan on the Torah, called the Jerisha and the Prisha. You know the difference between the Jerisha and the Prisha? The Prisha explains the Torah. And the Jerisha is doyresh, the Mekairos of the Torah. Then the Sma wrote a Pirush on the Darke Moshe. Then the Sma wrote the Sma, which is a Pirush on the Shulchan Aruch itself. The Sma had a very righteous wife. Now the, the Sma was a very smart man because his father-in-law was an Oysher Muflag. He's Oysher Muflag. But the Sma is the Sma, so he could get any Rabbanus in Europe. He says, why in the world would I become a Rabbi if I already have Parnasa? So the, masa, the Sma never took any position. He said, if I have Parnasa, why would, why would you uh, be, take a Rabbanus? So he, the Sma never took any Rabbanus. He spent his whole life Bolimera Torah. Now his wife came from a very wealthy household. And, uh, but his wife was such a tzaddikah, she was not nene me'oylam hazeh klum. She only ate because otherwise she wouldn't have energy to serve her husband. But once the sma died, she was poyresh me'oylam hazeh completely. She didn't eat. She was yoyshev betainis her entire life. Then she left Lemberg when the Sma died and she went to Eretz Yisrael. Can you imagine the times of the Kadmonim? And she is buried right next to Zechariah Hanavi on Har Hazesim, the wife of the Sma. Now, the, what does this have to do with anything? Nothing. It has nothing to do with anything. The wife of the Sma has a few psakim. One psak is that when you light Nerois, Yom Tif night, on Shabbos, first you light the Neiros and then you make the brachas. If you first make the bracha, you're Mechabal Shabbos. But Yom Tif, where you're allowed to light the, the Neiros on Yom Tif, the Sma's uh, wife, Paskind, first you make the bracha, and then you light the Neiros. Comes the Magen Avram, and the Magen Avram says, Are you kidding me? You're going to listen to a woman? Ein Chachma Ben Hashem. And therefore, uh, says the Magen Avram, Why would Chazal make a difference in there. It says the Magen Avram, why would Chazal make a uh, differentiation between Shabbos and Yom Tif? says the Magen Avram, you always light and then make the bracha, including Yom Tif. Comes the Noi de Bihuda, and the Noi de Bihuda says the Sma's wife is correct. Chachma benashim tamen. The Sma's wife is correct. The Noi, and that's what we do. We pass in like the wife of the Sma. By the way, comes the Chassam Soifer, and the Chassam Soifer says, what kind of argument is the Magen Avram? Why would Chazal make a differentiation in the Takana? Ner Chanukah, you first make the bracha, and then you light. So Ner Yom Tif, you can also first make the bracha, and then you light. That's the, the Psak of the wife of the Sma. By the way, she has another Psak, and that is, um, and this we don't really follow, I think Hasidim follow, and that is Leil Yom Tif, a woman could light, 
much later. She doesn't have to light on the onset of Yom Tov. She can light later in the... Okay. By the way, the Sma's wife was not the only Melumedes among the Achroinim. The mother of the Levush, the mother, excuse me, of the Marshal, was such a big Talmida Chachama, she was a Rosh Yeshiva and she gave Shir in a Yeshiva behind a curtain. So she didn't just occasion, she was, she was the Rosh Yeshiva. Anyway, now let's move on to who else is buried in Lemberg, the Taz. So yesterday, 24 hours ago, I was standing next to Rabbeinu David Halevi, the Taz. The Taz, the Pnei Yeshua said, was the greatest of all the Achroinim. So the Rabbi Yaakov Emdin and Yonah Sinavri says it was Marit, Pnei Yeshua says it was the Taz. So I'm going to tell you a story now about the Taz. This story is brought by the Ruach Chaim, Rav Chaim Velazhner. Rav Chaim Velazhner says a woman... Now, Rav Chaim Velazhner was not a storyteller. No, 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 no. As far as I know, this is the only recorded story in all of the writings of Rav Chaim Velazhner. A man, a woman came to the Taz, said, Adonenu David, my son, he's ill, he's sick, he's about to die, do something. So the Taz said, what do you want from my life? Hasachas aleikim anoichi, my God. So the woman said, you're not God, but I'm not pleading with you. I'm pleading with the Torah that you are learning. And the Taz says, oh, Atazai, you're right. In the zchus of the Torah that I'm learning now, your son should have a refuah shalema. And in fact, immediately the kid snapped out of it and he had a refuah shalema. Says Reb Chaim Velazhner, Harei shebechol esek mehat Torah bekoyacht veikusoy lahachayos mesim. Any Torah learning has the capacity to be mechayi mesim. This was not in the times of the Rishonim, times of Tanoam, Amaram, this was in the times of the Taz. By the way, the city of Lemberg is uh, soaked in blood. So you could stay in a hotel there. And if you do a little research, this Makkoim, it wasn't always a hotel. It used to be a torture chamber for Jews in the times of the Chalmanitsky pogroms. The city of uh, Lemberg was a capital of the Xeros of Tachvetat. And in fact, there was one city where the Taz was, and uh, the Cossacks had surrounded the city and they had cut off the food supply and they fasted to ward off the enemy and the Taz was davening and davening and he fainted in the middle of the tefillah and they showed him in his dream I will protect the city in the merit of David that means David being the Taz and they were mechazek in the tefillah and miraculously the city was saved so that, that's the Taz there's another interesting story. Story goes that in Mesifta uh, Tfaras Yushalayim, a man comes running into the Beis HaMedrash, says, Rav Moshe, a Jewish child, about 14, 15 years old, a boy was hit by a car, we should be mispala, we need to say Tehillim. And Rav Moshe said, no, it was a guy. No, I saw the boy had a yarmulke. The boy had a yarmulke. We need to daven. Maybe we should stop now in a few minutes. Say a few kapitals. Rav Moshe said, no. It was a guy. The man said, he was wearing a yarmulke. No, it doesn't matter. I don't care what you saw, what you say. It was a guy. Soon it became clear that, in fact, it was not a Jewish child. It was a Gentile child. And they asked Rav Moshe, you know, how, how are you so confident? How did you know this, th- these were the facts of the case? So Rav Moshe said, look, I was in the middle of learning and at that moment I was uh, involved in real Amelos Batayra. It is impossible that in the vicinity of my Amelos Batayra there would be any, any uh, Nisayon or any Tsar for Kla Yisrael in the vicinity of my Amelos Batayra. The Chazoynish is reputed to have said, that so long as Rav Baruch Ber and Rav Shimon Shkap were alive in Lita, the Nazis had no power and no shlita over Lithuanian Jewry. The hasmada of Rav Baruch Ber and Rav Shimon Shkap was such that it created this protective shield around Klal Yisrael, or around, around, at least around Lithuanian Jewry, and because of that, they were protected, and when they left to the Oilam Ha'emes, 
that is when uh, the, uh, the Nazi advance started. We say the Mishnah every day. Isn't it a pella? What do you mean? There's no reward in this world. You know that? The Gemara Nehran says, How can you say? So the Rambam says, this is not tzachar. These are uh, ancillary benefits. Because what are the mitzvahs listed in the Mishnah? G'milas chasodim, levayas hameis, hachnasas kala, it's beinodim lechaveroi. So if you are native to your friend and you help your friend in this world, then midah keneged midah, the Ribbon Shem has to give you reward in this world. So really, schar b'hayam aleka, there's no reward in this world. But by mitzvah, spain adam lachavero, since you're helping, you're benefiting somebody in this world, so Hashem has to pay you back uh, something in this world also. So ask Rebbe Chanan, another Rosh Hashiva, so what's the Talmud Torah keneged kulam? Why would a person get any benefit for Talmud Torah in this world? It's not Bein Adam Lechaveroi, that's Bein Adam Lamakon. Says Rabbi Chanan, quoting Rabbi Chaim Velazhner, that actually Talmud Torah is the greatest mitzvah Bein Adam Lamakon. But it's also the greatest mitzvah Bein Adam Lechaveroi. Because since the whole world stands on Torah, and if there would be a minute in this world that somebody wasn't learning, the world would cease to exist. In fact, Rav Chaim Velazhner is reputed to have said that the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu created time zones is so that every moment of the day, somebody's learning. So when a Yid is learning, they are literally pumping vitality. They're giving endurance. They're giving stability to the whole world. So the greatest native is not somebody who lends somebody money. The greatest native is not somebody who visits the sick. The greatest beneficiary of mankind is someone who is Oisek B'Tama Torah because they literally pump vitality into the whole world. So that's why even Talmud Torah is Elu Dvarim Sha'adam Al Chaparaseham Ba'ilam Hazah. So it comes out, what we're learning is, despite the fact that the Beis Hamikdash and Yushalayim was destroyed because of Rabbi Dezara, Gilei Arayas, and Shvichas Domim, but the music of Talmud Torah was so, so sweet and enchanting and magical, Takadosh Baruch Hu, that as long as Torah was going, as long as the music was being played, the Churbin was not possible. Churbin was not Shaykh. It was not feasible for there to be to the, the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. The only reason there's Churbin is because the Torah ceased, because of Bittal Torah. But B'makoim Torah ain't Churbin. When Torah is being learned, there is no Churbin. Churbin's not possible. It doesn't exist. At the Chanukah Sabayis of Yeshiva Kol Torah, Rav Shlomo Zalman said the following. There is a halach in Shulchan Aruch. When you build a new building, There's a halach in Shulchan Aruch. When you build a house, you build a new building, you put opposite the wall, opposite the entry, Ama by Ama, with no plaster and no paint. It's Halach and Shulchan Aruch. If only it would be a skula, maybe people would do it. But it's only a Halacha in the Shulchan Aruch. However, the Prima Gaudim is quick to comment, that's only in a house or in a building. However, in a shul, in a Beis HaMedrash, you do not make an Ama by Ama belisid without plaster. Says of Shlomo Zaman, why is that? Why don't you make a zeich lechorben in a Beis Hamedrash? Says of Shlomo Zaman, because b'makoim Taira ain chorben. You don't need to make a zeich lechorben in a place of a shul. In a place where there's a kol Taira, where people are learning, where there's shiurim, there is no chorben. Chorben is not possible. Chorben is not shayach. There is no, the concept, the Chorban has been transcended in a place where there's Talmud Torah. So you don't need to remember, recall, memorialize the Chorban Beis HaMikdash in a place where there's Talmud Torah. 
Says Reb Lezer Gordon. Rashiva tells anybody you know where was Reb Lezer Gordon buried? England. Very good. It was a, he went to money. Excellent. Reb Lezer Gordon is buried in London. I was lucky to be there at his kever. He was fundraising, and uh, he suddenly died, and he was buried over there in uh, in London. Says Reb Lezer Gordon. When, when, when a seum is made during the nine days, the lumdus, the mechanism of the seum, it's not that, okay, really, there's a time of mourning. So we're making a seum, and the seum is a simcha, and the simcha overrides the korban of the nine days. No, that's not the pshat. The pshat is b'makoim taira. If somebody has been so involved in learning that they've achieved the greatest Torah achievement, that they finish a Masechda, so in that realm, in that dimension, there is no Chorben. It's not that the Siyam overrides the Avelos, it's that in that realm, there is no Avelos, there is no Chorben. In that area, the Beis HaMikdash has not been destroyed. The same way we don't make a Zeche L'Chorben in a Beis HaMikdash, because the Makam Torah ain't... Chorben ein avelos, b'makom siyum, b'makom toira, ein avelos. It's not a loophole, it's not a way around the halacha. It transcends the chorben. There is no chorben, b'makom avelos. And therefore we come to the following idea. And I think it's a very relevant idea and a very powerful idea for our times. Says Rav Gifter, but Rabbi Hanan writes the same thing in the Kavetz Ma'amarim in the name of Rabbi Chaim Lashner. The Mishnah at the end of Soita is telling us about all the crises and all the disasters that will take place in the end of days. There will be chutzpah, there will be inflation, there will be immorality, there will be depression, there will be lack of respect. One tragedy after another, one horrendous phenomenon after another. And the Mishnah seems to end off on a good note. Valmila and Ulishain, don't worry, don't sweat it. At least we have Alabina Shabbat Shamayim. The Mishnah seems to end on a good note. Says Rabbi Khanan, the Mishnah in fact is ending with the biggest klala of all. You know what the biggest klala of all is? When things seem desperate, when things seem hopeless, when we experience a year of pandemic, when we experience collapse after stampede, after collapse, the biggest claw of all is to throw up your arms and to say, Oh, we don't know what to do! Ami Lenoli Shine! Don't worry, at least we have the Rebunish Shalalam. That's the biggest claw! To say we have no one to rely on other than the Rebbeinu Shalalam. That's a bizayon to the Torah. What do you mean we have nothing to rely on? We have everything to rely on. We have the Torah. The Rebbeinu Shalalam told us. The Torah is the source of all blessing. The Torah is the source of life. B'makam Torah ain't Chorben. B'makam Torah ain't Avelos. This Torah is the Tchias Hamesim, the elixir of life. The biggest clue of all will be that in 2021, Yidin will say, I don't know, it's hopeless. We have nothing to rely on. We'll just have to rely on Hashem. That's a disgrace to the Torah. The Rebbe Hashem gave us the remedy. What are you folding up your arms and saying, oh, we'll have bitachan on Hashem. Hashem doesn't want you to have bitachan on Him. He told you what to do. Don't disgrace the medicine and the remedy Hashem gave us. The biggest klala of all will be to say, Ein lanu ami lehishayin ela alavinu shabbat shamayim, says Rabbi Hanan. Why was the second Beis HaMikdash destroyed? The popular answer is, Sinas Chinam. Says Ramchal, no. The Ramchal writes, in the Derech Eitz Chaim, if you look in the back of any Masil Susharim, if you take a look at number 21, the Ramchal says, Ki ein hinem mimamorim elu tovin, v'taskil b'sichol chahazach, ki ein trufa lamakasenu ki em b'eisek ha-toira. 
in our times, in our days, there's no medication, there's no remedy other than the, uh, the engagement of learning. There is nothing that weakens the power of the Yet Sahara and the Sitra Akhra except for Bittul, except for Esa Katoira. The Darch Yitz Chaim Rab Shamshin Mashripoli is quoted by the Ramchal that in 1648-1649 when tens of thousands of Jews were being massacred and he wanted to figure out why was it happening. So he made a hashbas chaloim and he summoned the sitra achra and he said, sitra achra, why is it happening? And the sitra achra said, let's strike a deal. You stop keeping Shabbos, you stop doing mila, you stop learning and I'll stop killing Jews. And Rav Shamsun Meyashtabholi says, there are many things I would stop doing, but I will not stop learning for a moment. Says the Ramchal, Harei tovin v'teida, Shekol hakaboloi shenosati l'chad heino hinemes. Limud hatoira for the sitra achra is the sam hamoves. Ula achinu beis Yisrael hu sam hachain. And even though the Gemara says the second beis hamikdash was destroyed because of sinas chinam, says Ramchal, not really. Says Ramchal, we are in Golos today for the same reason we are in Golos. From the first base of Mikdash, which is Al Ozvam Es Tairasi. In fact, do you remember the Gemara Yuma says that after, when the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, they looked up and what was coming out of the base of Mikdash? They saw the image of a lion. And that represented the fact that the first base of Mikdash was destroyed because of the powerful, mighty draw and allure of Avodah Zarah. But by the second base of Mikdash, which animal was creeping and crawling around the Temple Mount? Shualim, the foxes. So the Archaner says, because the fox is very sly and clever, it was because of the sly and clever sin that the Yetzirah persuades us to do, namely, Sinas Chinam. You know, really, you should love every Jew, but not him, and not him, and not that one, and not this one. And very cleverly, the Yetzirah persuades us that every Jew is uh, permitted to have Sinas Chinam toward. But the Chassam Sofer writes differently. Sam Sofer says the fox doesn't represent Sinas Chira. Do you remember when the Romans made a decree we weren't allowed to learn Torah and Rabbi Kiva was still teaching Torah Barabim and they said, they said, Rabbi Kiva, what are you doing? You're endangering your life. Rabbi Kiva says, let me give you a mashal. There was a fox walking by the riverside and he turns to the fish. He says, fish, let's go for a shpatsir. Come onto the dry land. And the fish said to the fox, let's make a Kabbalah Chaymer. If in the water, where is the place of my life? I'm in danger from the fishermen. Certainly if I leave the water and go to dry land, I'm in danger. So too says Rabbi Akiva. If while I'm learning, which is kihem chayenu v'orach yamenu, we're in danger, then if I would forsake learning, certainly my life would be in danger. The fox represents the Avera of Betel Torah. That fox that Rabbi Akiva said, the mashal, were for the Romans trying to stop Limar Taira, the fox is the symbol of Bito Taira. And therefore says the Chassam Soifer, when they saw the foxes marching on the Temple Mount after Bayasheni, that teaches us the second Mesa Mikdash too was destroyed because of Bito Taira al Azvam S. Tairasi. The biggest klal of all is that in 2021, Jews say, what are we going to do? We have nothing to do. We can only rely on the Rebbein Shalom. When you hear that, you know Mashiach is coming soon because that's the biggest klala of all. The last thing the Rebbein Shalom wants you to say is, Ein lanu lihishayim ela alavinu shabbat shamayim. God said, I gave you the remedy. What are you relying on me for? I can't do anything. I gave it to you. Cut it out with the bitachain. Cut it out with the einlan amili shayin. I gave you the medicine. I gave you the samachayim. Says Rav Chanan, says Rav Gifter, and says Rav Chaim Velashner. So we make a siyum in the nine days. We're not circumventing the halacha. We're creating a dimension that transcends the Chorban in the first place. So may we be zoicha, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us take advantage of the tools and the 
that which is needed to create, as the Bnei Yisoscha writes, I was just there two days ago, in Dinav. Bnei Yisoscha writes, how many hours in the three weeks? 528 hours in the three weeks. Can I get the 528 prokim in Shas? Because begematria mafteach, key. Because that's the key to the Geula. May we be zoichet to turn the key. May the door open wide. May we be zoichet that this Tishabav, which is the Leda of Mashiach, may he be Neskala ben Hervi Amenu. Amen. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.